Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer and my guest today is Mary O'Malley. This is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. Uh, for more information or to help support our efforts, please visit us at batgap.com. Um, Mary is an author, a counselor, and an awakening mentor in, who lives in Kirkland, Washington. In the early 1970s, a powerful awakening set Mary on the path to changing her whole relationship with the challenges of her life, freeing herself from a lifelong struggle with darkness. Since that time, Mary has taught extensively throughout the U.S., Canada, and Denmark. She's an inspirational speaker who leads retreats and that transform people's lives, including week-long retreats in beautiful places like Costa Rica and Hawaii. She also provides individual counseling and offers ongoing groups where people can come together to experience the miracle of awakening. Mary's new book, which I've been reading, is called What's in the Way is the Way, and it's been endorsed by a number of luminaries, Dr. Christian Northrup, Jack Cornfield, Neil Donald Walt, Stephen Levine. Um, and as usual, I'll be linking to Mary's website and her books um, from her page on batgap.com. So welcome, Mary. Oh, so glad to be here, Rick. Yeah. So we can start in any number of places with your personal story, with your book. But uh, just for kicks, I had the thought to start with the question, you know, the title of your book, What's in the Way is the Way? And the question arose, the way to what? <laughs> to openness, mm -hmm. to connectedness. Most of us live in a dream. We live in an afterthought about life. I like what Alan Watts, the wonderful Zen philosopher, said, no matter how many times you say the word water, it will never be wet. Mm -hmm. And we long for the wetness of life and not even aware that we're cut off from that. Mm. And so the wetness in this metaphor represents the living moment, being fully here, open, connected, opening to the great flow of life. So life flows through you as you, rather than you actually trying to do life, which is what, where most people live. Yeah. Um, one thing I was thinking about while I was reading your book is that I'd like to talk with you about kind of the, f the fundamental assumptions uh, the underpinnings of the points you make. So, for instance, one fundamental assumption that you're kind of alluding to right now is that um, there's a, kind of an inherent fulfillingness to life, if we can be open to it. And another is that, uh, we, well, you we haven't gotten into this quite as much yet as we will, but that also that there's an intelligence that, um, yes. that is kind of permeating everything and, and orchestrating everything. Right, right. And that hopefully we'll be able to explore that more deeply as we go on. But that is, you know, the more that you wake up out of the uh, what I call the storyteller in this book, which its main game is struggle. It's a little problem factory <laughs> and mostly its problems are little ones. It doesn't like how its hair is today or the length of the stoplight, but life can throw us some pretty big challenges. And what we do is we struggle with those challenges rather than staying open. And the more that you open, the more you see that, you know, at one time you were just one cell that was so tiny you couldn't even see it with the naked eye. And this cell knew how to divide and develop all of the different systems inside of us, the circulatory system, the nervous system, the reproductive system. And uh, now we are made of 70 trillion cells. When was the last time that you were in charge of your body? <laughs> the intelligence of life is in charge of life. And that's what we don't see when we're caught in the game of struggle. Yeah. It's interesting to note that most of those cells aren't human, you know? About 90% of them, or 95% of them, are various kinds of bacteria and things. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. In a symbiotic relationship. Right. We'd die without them. Mm -hmm. um, well, the reason I think fundamental assumptions are important is that, you know, I, I don't know if you did a, some kind of statistical sociological survey, but it seems to me that most people in the world just kind of don't go through their day assuming or, or appreciating that they are immersed in a, an ocean of intelligence and yes. that, you know, that there's some kind of evolutionary impulse 
trying to guide their destiny and so on. I mean, most people sort of are kind of locked into the gross material perception of things. Right. You know, and maybe right. they believe there's a God off someplace and that they're going to go to heaven right. or something like that, but it doesn't really, you know, kind of yeah, sink they into don't the... connect. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And to me, the word God is a verb. Hmm. You know, it's not a thing. It's a verb. This is a living, alive, intelligent, mysterious process. And each one of us have been brought forth out of mystery because life wanted to express itself as us. And it is uh, the suffering that we create for ourselves by thinking that we're in charge of it and we're in control and uh, we're always trying to do, do it good enough or right enough and then believe that we don't do it good enough or right enough. I had an uh, image that came the other day. Imagine a snow globe, you know, one of those little globes that, you know, you shake it and, you know, there's little people in there and the snow, you know, falls down. It's almost as if we're all caught in a snow globe, a snow globe of the unconscious mind. And the glass of the globe is made out of fear and it's glued together with judgment. Well, so much of awakening is discovering how to step out of the snow globe and learn how to observe, to, to relate to what's passing through you, thoughts, feelings, sensations rather than identifying with them as soon as you identify with them you're back in the snow globe again and what we long for is this spaciousness this awareness that we really truly are that can see what's happening in the snow globe but not identify with it hmm. So babies seem pretty spacious. You know, some people think yeah. babies are enlightened and all. I would, I would dispute. Uh, yeah, no, 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 yeah. I would dispute that. But uh, you know, they seem pretty spacious. But obviously, as we go through the first few years of our life, and uh, we get more and more and more kind of locked in and identified and all. So, um, and by the time we're teenagers, we're usually a total mess. <laughs> but um, what, how, how would you describe the um, mechanics or, or of the this? progressive identification that that takes place as we yeah. mature and yeah. uh, you know which most people never set about reversing exactly you know exactly and and yeah. so, so let's talk about how that identification and perhaps it has an upside it perhaps it's necessary for us to get more and more identified at a certain stage yeah. of our growth and then eventually yeah. it becomes appropriate to turn it around so let's talk about that yeah so there's two pieces of, of what you're asking you know to me it seems kind of crazy that we uh, we come out of mystery and uh, we arrive here and we're wide open to life and we have no separate identity. There was a time when there was no thoughts in our head. And slowly and surely, we begin to take on, oh, I am separate. I am a girl. I am a boy. Uh, my name is John or my name is Mary. And slowly and surely, we crawl into what I call the storyteller in this book. And, uh, and then we go to school. And school is a very cruel place. You know, I, I say that you uh, come across the red pencil syndrome, the excellent good, fair, and poor syndrome. And then all of a sudden, now you've got to do life, and you've got to do life right, but you're not feeling that you're doing it good enough or right enough. We all carry this spell, that's a word I use in this new book, uh, this spell of not enoughness. And so you can see what happens in teenagehood. We are, we all of a sudden are trying to be what we think we should be and we're looking around and making sure that we're doing what everybody else is doing or if that doesn't work, we turn into the rebel and we crawl into this separate self. And we have 65,000 thoughts a day, and 95% of them are repeats from the day before. That's where most people live. They think that they are their thoughts. And the older you get, the tighter that gets, the more suffering you uh, experience. Because thought does not create reality. Thought cannot control reality, although there's just enough of an illusion of that that you can stay caught in this world of, of this separate self. But then 
uh, like in my life, you're really blessed if you're given something you can't control. Because that is maybe the first inkling that just maybe, maybe I am more than I thought I am. Maybe, just maybe, I am not this struggling self. Now, the other part of your question is, oh my God, maybe we're supposed to do that. I mean, it seems kind of insane if you really think about it. We arrive out of mystery. We are we are connected. We're not consciously aware, but we are at one with everything. And then we take on this separate self. You know, why is that? And the only way that I can make sense of that is that when you look at the world, you see that it is uh, a dualistic in nature. You know, there's hot, there's cold, there's day, there's night, there's male, there's female, there's winter, there's summer. And if there was no such thing as night, you wouldn't recognize day. It is recognized in relationship. So the only thing that makes sense to me is we are supposed to take on what we're not, get lost in it, and then something very spectacular is beginning to happen. The people that that have come before us are that have seen through this game of struggle and become the fullness of who they are were usually people that lived in caves or monasteries or you know they removed themselves from life so they could get quiet enough to really observe this whole stream of thought, this stream of sensations, this stream of feelings that is moving through who we really are. Well, at least in my world, awakening is happening everywhere. I mean, you can see it in the movies, you can see it, you know, in television programs. There's, we are in what I think is an evolutionary shift. And that to me is why there's so much fear on this planet. ISIS, Ebola, you know, uh, uh, poverty, greed, you know, all this craziness is not here because we've done something wrong. In my world, it is the contraction of the old that is calling our attention to it so that like Ebola, we can begin to get to know fear rather than being lost in it. And more and more people are beginning to wake up out of the dream of this separate, struggling, fear-based, very judgmental, self that we thought was who we are <laughs> yeah no from my perspective there's this global awakening too i mean i wouldn't be doing this show if there weren't um i wouldn't be able to do it i mean the guys in caves don't have very good internet connections right um, <laughs> um, but you know i mean there are people who say as you just said that well it seems like all this stuff is hitting us now ebola and isis and all these right. things but, but you know i mean uh, nearly 100 years ago, there was World War I, and then there was a global yeah. flu pandemic that killed right. what, 25 million people or something. And, right. uh, and then there was the Great Depression, and, the, you know, and then there was yeah. World War II. So there have always been some pretty heavy things happening. Um, but, yeah, but go the ahead. difference, Rick, is that now we're connected. You know, yeah, through yeah. the internet, so we can see it more clearly. Just like when a great challenge comes in our life, what's in the way is the way. Mm -hmm. The challenges in our life are not here because we've done something wrong. We are being punished. God fell asleep on the job. The challenges are here in order to help you see this conditioned, mm -hmm. separate, struggling uh, conversation in your head. And in the, my very first teacher taught me this, in the seeing is the movement. Hmm. If you feel that you have to fix this separate self or make it a better self, I mean, sometimes that helps make an easier life. But that's not where true healing is. True healing is discovering how to relate to all the fear, the despair, the loneliness, the shame, all of these energies that contract us and keep us from being open to life. Hmm. And that kind of gets us back to fundamental assumptions. Um, you know, you're saying that all these things are, you know, not 
capricious or arbitrary or mm -hmm. or mean spirited or anything on the right. on the part of some creator that there's I'm putting words in your mouth but that there's a kind of an uh, uh, divine benevolent uh, intelligence yeah. that actually yeah. wants things to wants us to evolve and grow and yeah. and and become enlightened and that you know we do live in a as you as you were saying a a world of polarities and opposites so if you're going to have hot you have to have cold and if you're going to have healthy you have to have sick but but what you're saying if, if i'm correct is that the sick phase is not uh just to counterbalance the healthy phase there's evolutionary potential in it absolutely absolutely you know, and that's what we're beginning to see that what we learned in this conditioned self was to try to get to what we think would bring us happiness and resist or get away from what we think doesn't bring us happiness. Now, can you see how unbalanced that is? Yeah, you're leaning over there. <laughs> I know, and it, what you can't see on the camera, this hand is really reaching out there and this hand down here is saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> and if you begin to observe the conversation that moves through you all day and how it uh, uh, affects the this uh, chronic holding in your body, mm -hmm. you know, you will see that is suffering mm -hmm. right there. That's suffering. Okay, so case in point. So you had uh, shoulder surgery recently and we had mm -hmm. to we had to postpone our interview because you were going through a painful recovery. So you know, that was something that might be perceived as being in the way, you know, it was in the way of right. doing, doing the interview and it was probably in the way of you getting a good night's sleep or being comfortable or anything like that. Oh, yes. Um, and so in what way was that pain um, conducive to your growth? Well, let me tell you a story about the surgery that that, you know, will highlight this. So uh, I uh, you don't eat or drink you know, since the night before, and I'm supposed to show up at 1230. And they uh, call and say, please show up at 130. And so I show up at 130. And they get me undressed and put me in a little room, but nothing's happening. So finally, at 330, my mind started getting very upset. In In the meantime, I was just spacious, and I could watch all the conversations going through me. I could watch the body start to contract in discomfort because I was thirsty and I was hungry, but I didn't get caught in it. I could see it and it would just pass through. But at 3.30, the mind took over and, and it started, hey, is anybody out there? You know, <laughs> and they came back and they said, uh, uh, oh, it'll be a half an hour more. Mm. Well, it was an hour more. Mm. And this is great fuel because the unconscious separate self wants everything to be okay. And it, it sees discomfort as something that takes away okayness. What is really true is that our resistance and wanting to get someplace and get away from something is what covers the natural okayness that is always here no matter what is happening in your life. And I was so spacious when the doctor finally walked in. She, the first thing she said was, how are you doing? And I said, how are you doing? <laughs> because my heart was wide open mm. because I knew the reason why it was happening was because the surgery before me was a, turned out to be a much more complicated surgery. If I had stayed in that separate self, you know, I would have grumbled. I would have, and this is somebody that's going to be cutting into my body for heaven's sakes, you know. And so we just connected because I kept on connecting with discomfort, with holding on, with resistance, and I kept on opening around it. And that's what I did, you know, the whole time. In the recovery, were there times that the contraction took over, just like it did at 3.30 for a bit, you know, and I began to move out of the contraction. But as soon as the nurse left, curiosity kicked in and said, okay, who's here? Oh, oh, okay. The one that I understand, this is very uncomfortable, but this just passing show, we're creating more suffering by resisting it. Let's stay open to it. And it's so wonderful, Rick, when you know how to recognize the unconscious self, the resistant unconscious self, the grasping unconscious self, 
and bring it space. Hmm. That's what we long for. So even in your recovery period over the last couple of weeks, in the, in the midst of the pain that you were experiencing, you, you were able to pretty much do that and, you know. Yes, and I've done this for years. Yeah. And uh, I w had the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful grace of meeting and hanging out with Stephen Levine for mm -hmm. many years, who wrote many books on death and dying. But uh, it, they really were about uh, being fully alive. And when he w would, every year he came to Seattle, I brought all my groups to Seattle. And, and you know, there would be like 600 of us, you know, in this huge room. Mm -hmm. And he would talk for a little bit on Saturday morning, and then he would open it up and say, somebody this meeting at Edge, you know, come to the microphone. Well, people would come to the microphone, Rick, that were dying, yeah. or their loved one just, or their child just died, or, or, or they were uh, in chronic, horrible pain. And because he had uh, walked through the dying process with thousands of people, and because he had discovered how to meet his own pain, it was phenomenal to watch these people being met right where they were, and you could just feel the energy opening up. Hmm. And his definition of healing, I think, is one of the most powerful de definitions of healing I've ever come across. And maybe this is just one of his definitions. He may have others. Healing is bringing awareness and mercy into that which we have held in judgment and in fear. Hmm. That's the game of struggle. And so much of awakening is learning how to slowly and surely open your eyes and actually experience what you're experiencing without judging it with great compassion. So even the great discomfort begins to just move through you. And, you know, I still got caught at times. You know, my uh, had a family member that was uh, almost died in ICU, you know, last March, you know, and, and uh, sitting in that room for six days, you know, uh, you know all the states of mind, the, 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 fear, the dread, the anxiousness, the, the judgment, you know, what did I do wrong? You know, uh, these states would come and my job over and over again, I would watch myself starting to contract into unconsciousness. And then I would get curious. Healing is bringing awareness and mercy into that which we've held in judgment and in fear. And to be absolutely able to be spacious around fear or spacious around despair, this is one of the core gifts that we can be given by life. Mm. Several points come to mind as you were speaking. Uh, one is, you remember you remember Dale Borglum? You know Dale? No, I don't. Oh, I, I interviewed him just three weeks ago. He and, and Ram Dass and Stephen, and was it Stephen Levine, is it? Um, started the Death and Dying Project in, right. in Santa Fe many years ago, and Dale's still doing that also in the Bay Area. Um, but in any case, that's just a little aside. Um, I was reminded of this analogy that's used in sort of Indian teachings, which is, uh, has to do with the ability of things to make deep impressions and, the, and for those impressions to stick and be ten right. tenacious. And the analogy is that, you know, if you take like a, make a line in stone with some tool, then the line, first of all, you can't make it very deep because the stone is hard, but also it stays a long time. And then let's say you make a line in sand, you know, you can make it deeper mm. and, and it doesn't stay so long. And then let's say you make a line in water, you can make it even deeper more easily, but yeah. it, it stays even less time. And then line yeah. in air, you know, you can make yeah. it any, Beautiful. any depth and it, Beautiful. it doesn't stay. So it, what the analogy tells us is firstly regarding the, you know, the tenacity of, of the impressions that, that we incur according to the spaciousness of our awareness. But secondly, also, it implies that um, with a more spacious awareness, experiences are not going to be exactly. muted. They're going to be actually more vivid, it, it, vivid and rich. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But, but all as an invitation to relate to rather than from them. Mm -hmm. And I love to say 
you know, uh, uh, I, I talked about this a lot in the, my book, The Gift of Our Compulsions, which its premise is our core compulsion is struggle. And all of the other compulsions are an attempt to numb out from that unease of struggle. Mm. And, uh, and I also talk about it in what's in the way is the way is the what we don't recognize. And if you look at nature closely, you'll see it. Everything flows. Mm -hmm. Water flows. Sound flows. Air flows. Day flows into night. Sap flows up the tree and then down the tree. Okay. We are that flow. When we were first born, energy just flowed through us. And then slowly and surely, we learn how to contract around this. And it's not, it's, oh, it's not okay to be angry or it's not okay to be exuberant or I'm a sissy if I'm, I cry or whatever. And it looks like what we do is bound up, bind up feelings. But really what we do is we bind up our energy. And whether you call it fear or loneliness or despair or dread or shame or guilt, really what those are is your bound up joy. And as you learn how to be spacious then and relate to these bound up places inside of you, they pass through you, just like your hand passing through water. Mm. There's a Sanskrit saying that says, uh, contact with Brahman is infinite joy. And Brahman means total, un 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 you know, totality, unboundedness. Yes. Um, <laughs> so one thing that I experienced when I began to kind of get it more into the groove of flowing rather than controlling, um, and I think that it, it, is that there was this balancing act between um, kind mm -hmm. of a passivity in which I would just sort of like, oh, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, just kind of like mm -hmm. go with the flow, even if maybe the flow wasn't the best way to go, um, between that and controlling. And mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of a many year process, and it's probably still going on, of right. lear learning where to find that balance point. Right. Yeah, because both are necessary. I, I love to say that uh, the body has bones. Mm -hmm. And if it didn't have bones, what would it be like? <laughs> well, it'd be okay, like a pile of mush. A pile of mush. The body has muscles. Yeah. What would it be like if it was all muscle? You know, it, it wouldn't work. And so uh, we've lived so long in the doing place that it takes a while to begin to really connect with what being is all about. We think being is all about sitting down by the side of the road mm. and just letting life happen. I am much more engaged with life now that I am grounded here and that, that my, my, my ground is openness to what life is offering right now. And out of that openness comes doing, mm -hmm. you know, like writing a book, you know, sure. uh, you know, it, out of that comes doing, but I'm not doing it. D life is doing it. And that when, when we come to that place, it's such joy. There is a deep, 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 uh, even to say it's cellular is, is not even good enough. It, it, there's a deep trust of life. And I, I love to say that the ego is all about getting happiness and that, you know, that's okay. And you can grab happiness. You know, you can find a mate that uh, is your dream mate. And then six months later, you find they squeeze the toothpaste tube from the middle, you know. Mm -hmm. But joy is the ability to be with what is. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's good points. Um, for some reason, the other day I was thinking of that Bible verse where Christ said something like, um, you know, come to me, all those who are heavy, heavily laden, burdened or something, and I will give you rest. And then he said, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And, um, yes. and it's interesting because the word yoga relates to, it comes from a, a word meaning yoke to unite. And um, then what you were just saying a minute ago that reminded me of 
point in the Gita where it says established in being perform action. Yes, so that's it. So it wasn't like established in being sit by the side of the road and just vegetate. Yeah. It was perform action. In fact, in, in that specific instance, it was go out and fight a battle. Lord Krishna was saying it to Arjuna. Uh, right. So there's this kind of a simultaneous coexistence of yes of complete opposites, but they 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 mesh very yeah. nicely, don't they? Yeah. And Stephen talked a lot about soft belly. Mm. And I sent these cards out. In fact, if their viewer, your viewers are interested, they can email at awaken at mariomalley.com and I'll send them three beautiful cards. And the first is just a question mark mm -hmm. because that's the first aspect of consciousness, the ability to be curious about what is. The second is a heart. That's the second aspect of consciousness, the ability to be spacious or meet in our heart what is. Well, the third card is soft belly because we have this such this amazing biofeedback mechanism inside of us that it is a guarantee that you learned when you were very young to hold your breath. And when you held your breath, you tightened your belly and we all ran away to this separate self thinking we are it. And as you're returning, as you're becoming embodied again, as you are becoming the dance of life, rather than doing the dance, the belly can help you immensely because it will tell you long before you get in your head that you're lost in the unconscious self again. Hmm. <laughs> and over and over again to soften your belly, we long for our breath to move down fully. I mean, watch dogs and cats breathe, babies breathe. They all breathe you know, with their whole, well, actually their whole body, but you can see it the most in the trunk. And yet most of us, by the time we go to school, are holding our breath. So if your uh, listeners are interested, uh, I will have sent to them those three cards. They're so beautiful. The question mark, remember Stephen said healing is bringing awareness and mercy. I call it curiosity and compassion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the question mark, the heart, and then the soft belly. Hmm. And my belly is pretty soft, but not in the good sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an inner. It's right. an inner openness to life. Yeah. Well, what was the email address again to get those cards? Awaken, the word. A W A K E N mm -hmm. at MarioMalley dot com. Okay. M A R Y O M A L L E Y dot com. Okay. I imagine you'll get a bunch of emails. Mm. I would love to spread. I, I figure I'm Johnny Appleseed. Yeah. You know, and I would love to spread that this. We will not make it as a species if more and more of us uh, don't come into consciousness. Right. Yeah, that's a whole topic for discussion too is the the societal implications of this and the the reason for all the the kind of uh, serious problems that beset us you know being exactly being rooted in ultimately in a in consciousness or in a, in a deficiency of, of consciousness exactly yeah exactly in a belief in struggle mm -hmm. and a belief in fear and a belief in shame you know, it, it's just uh, most people don't want anybody to know, let alone themselves know, how deeply they have put themselves out of their own heart. Hmm. But, you know, the word belief, uh, I, I often hear teachers use that word, and um, I also often hear them use the word willingness, like you just have to be willing to kind of open up and this and that. And um, in a way... It, it, it kind of implies that one can just turn on a dime, you know, whereas in fact there are layer after layer after layer, layer after yeah. layer of conditioning that's taken yes. decades to accumulate. Yes. And so you don't want to give people the impression that they're kind of like lame or something if they can't just open up and be all breathing from the belly and <laughs> do all this stuff, you know, on the spot. It's, it's going to be a, a process. It's a process. Somebody asked Stephen, how long has this taken? He said, it's the work of a lifetime. Yeah. But what I will add to it, Rick, 
is it's the only game in town. Right. I mean, when you begin to hear about consciousness or awakening, I mean, that is truly a gift from life. And I love metaphors. And so I have the one metaphor that comes to mind right now is everybody lives uh, in the in the middle of the deep, dark forest in a prison. And this prison has multiplex theaters and, you know, uh, uh, car races mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, wonderful restaurants and all that. All right. And all the way around the uh, perimeter is a fence. It's not even a very high fence. But on each fence post is a sign that says, do not cross this fence or you will die. That's the separate self that is terrified of opening to life. Yes, we long to open to life more than you can possibly imagine, but we're also terrified of it. But the people that listen to you uh, and the people that I work with, they've crossed the fence. Uh, maybe not even because they wanted to. They were just compelled. And for a long time, uh, it looks like you're wandering in the forest. And uh, but the the more you wake up and the more the trees thin and the more you you come to this, uh, you know, bluff, you can see forever and you become big enough that you can look back at your journey and you can see every step of the way was absolutely necessary. And that's why I do retreats and do phone groups and phone counseling and all that, because we need to gather together. We need to, it, it's, it's almost like learning a language. Yeah, you can read about, let's say you want to learn Spanish and you can read and you can uh, start saying, hola, mi amor. But it isn't until you start conversing with somebody that it actually begins to integrate inside of you. And so I believe very strongly we need to have interview shows like this and we need to have retreats like I do or groups because we need to gather together in these small groups of people that begin to grok the language of consciousness. That's a really, I like the Spanish analogy because I mean, I was really, I took Spanish many times when I was in grammar school and high school and I was always lousy at it. And, um, you know, I'd sit in a class, struggle through it, go home and speak English and just forget it, forget about it. Probably right. not, probably not even do my homework because it wasn't interesting. And then I'd go back to the class the next day and be looking at the clock waiting for this to end. So, you know, imagine that compared to becoming an exchange student and going to Spain, you know, and living with a family in Spain being for, immersed. for a yes. year. Yeah, being immersed. Yes. So with this spirituality stuff, I mean, you know, you can stick your toe in, uh, read a yeah. book, you know, look, listen to an Eckhart Tolle tape or something, or you can kind of like really make it your primary focus or as, yes. as much as your life will allow and you're going to get very different results. Yes. Yes, and one of the most powerful things about coming into a group of people that are also exploring consciousness is that you discover we're all nutty as fruitcakes. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you begin to discover that all those places you didn't want anybody else to know that you thought, the jealousy that you feel, the arrogance that you feel, the uh, uh, judgment of other people that you feel, the judgment towards yourself that you feel, the pickiness that you get lost into sometimes, the irritation, you begin to discover that we're all caught in the same place. It's so freeing yeah. when you begin to see that because you let go of the war. Oh, a good person never feels judgment. Well, pahooey, you know, this separate self is glued together with judgment. Awakening isn't stopping that. Awakening is having enough space around it that you don't identify with it. In fact, I love to say, oh, hi. Oh, you're here today. Oh, you're having a bad day. <laughs> and you say that to a part of yourself that, that formerly you didn't even want yourself to know that was there inside of you because we have it all. <laughs> it's funny that nutty as fruitcakes thing you said because I often wonder, have wondered, you know, does spirituality make you nutty or does, does it attract nutty people? You know? <laughs> I think maybe a little bit of both. A little bit of both, but you know, I like what Jack Kornfield said once. Mm -hmm. On the journey of going sane, mm. it looks at times like you're going insane because what you're doing is you're lifting the veil 
and the heart is opening. Yeah. So, and I was taught when I was 27 how to be curious, but it didn't really uh, uh, come on full board and st- until I met Stephen when I was 39, because he taught me how to be curious with great heart. Mm. And so as you lift this veil, you kind of see, well, there's a lot of stuff inside there that we could call grody, but we see it's just the unconscious system that all human beings have, and most people are run by it. And Mm. you begin to decide, I don't want to be run by that anymore. Yeah. So what would you say to someone who who said to you, you know, I just want to live a, a normal, happy life. I don't care so much about enlightenment and all that all that stuff. I just want to sort of be comfortable, not go through all kinds of turmoil and angst and everything in the, that so many spiritual people spend seem to spend years at doing. You know, I just want to kind of like be peaceful and, and simple yeah. and ordinary, you know. I mean, does spirituality have to be a long drawn out ordeal of catharsis and, you know, change or, or and, you know, answer the question. Go ahead. Sorry. Everybody's journey is different. And for some, it is a very fierce process. It's a birth. If you've ever watched a birth, this is a fierce process. We are being born back into life. But just like with birth, what do they do with women? They teach them breathing. Mm. And breathing is, you know, I think it's in all four of my books, you know, the the power of breath because it's so powerful. And I I did a uh, 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 class for years at our local hospital you know, on the power of breath. And so if somebody comes to me and says, you know, I really don't want to explore at all, but I just want to have an easier life, I would connect them with their breath. Mm-hmm. Breath is, is uh, your best friend uh, as you go through life. And most of us just hold on to it. And so we're just half alive. Hmm. So would you say that... I don't know. Some people don't seem to have a choice. Like it really kind of right. grips you by the collar and drags yep. you along. And, and other yep. people seem to be able to modulate it and, you know, ramp it up yep. or, or amp it down to, to the extent that they can remain comfortable. I, I mean, I have, I've interviewed people and I have friends who were just minding their own business. And all, yes. all of a sudden this huge awakening took place and they've, right. they, 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 you know, uh, well, Eckhart Tolle is a good example. He, right. Obviously, he was depressed, but you know, and he's happy he had that awakening. But he, he couldn't do much more than sit in a park bench for a couple exactly. Of years afterwards. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And again, everybody's journey is different, and it's just the storyteller, this unconscious self, that relates to this birthing process as something is painful. Uh, my first child. Uh, I, both both of my children, I had completely natural childbirth. And the first child, 18 hours, uh, probably for the last three or four, I resisted every single contraction. Mm. I had no uh, good coach there. You know, uh, I was living out in the woods and we came into a nature pass office. You know, it was just very painful. Three years later, I've learned a lot. I've grown a lot. Uh, my son came in five hours, and this the room was filled with light, hmm. and it was it, there was only one contraction I wasn't open to. There was only one contraction that I t- started to contract around. So my life is a good example. I was one of those people that was just crushed by life. I mean, I tried to. Yeah, tell uh, us your story. You have quite a story, and sometimes I start with that, you know. But uh, yeah, let's go yeah. into it now. Yeah. Well, and I will say this, Rick, I was gifted with great darkness Mm. and I am not being facetious. I'm not being Pollyannish. I was gifted with great darkness. I had the kind of childhood you wouldn't wish on anybody. And uh, I discovered the uh, joy of numbing through food when I was about 10. Mm -hmm. And then I discovered alcohol when I went away to college, you know, and then I discovered uh, uh, street drugs. Mm -hmm. And when I was 23, I gained 97 pounds in a year while I was washing a lot of it down with alcohol and getting every single drug, both prescription and non-prescription I could because I didn't know how to be with 
what I was experiencing. Mm. And uh, they started me on psychiatrists when I was 10. And so everybody tried to fix me, psychiatrists, psychologists, group therapy, hypnotherapy, hospitals, you know, all of this, it, there was something wrong with Mary and she needed to be fixed. All I heard was there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. So when I was 24, I tried to kill myself three times. And the last time was with slitting pills? my wrist. Oh, the wrist, okay. Well, well, I did pills, I did... Which, which it's hard for me to say this, but I was unconscious enough that I got really drunk, got in my car, and made a decision of which overpass I was going to drive into. Mm. Didn't even think about the other people that I could have hurt. Right. But that was the level of contraction that I was living in. And something, I, I headed toward it, and something pulled the wheel mm. right at the last minute. And I, I wasn't relieved. I was angry, hmm. you know. And then when I slit my wrist, I, thank God I didn't know that you slit up. But I just kept on, you know, doing the razor blade over and over again. And I can remember exactly where I was. I was sitting on the floor and I was sobbing and I was filled with so much self-hate because I was even a failure at suicide. Hmm. Then... When I was 27, my mother, I had moved back from Europe and uh, I was living uh, in this basement apartment with my mother uh, upstairs. And, uh, and she uh, was going to go to a yoga weekend and couldn't go and said, do you want to go? And you know, it was kind of like, oh, well, okay, you know. And so I went, and uh, this man was one of the uh, first people that really brought yoga to the United States, Joel Kramer. And what he really taught was yana yoga. And it was like I stepped out of a B-grade black and white horror movie and into a Dolby surround sound Technicolor Panavision movie. And I couldn't tell you what he said. I, I couldn't tell you. All I, I re at least recognize that there was something here that was true and real. And so the third time he came up from California, I drug in a reel-to-reel a -reel tape deck that, you know, dates me a bit, recorded the whole thing, transcribed the whole thing. And when my house and store burned to the ground, I lost everything. But it's that notebook I grieved because I could go back into that notebook. I was still caught a lot in this struggling self, but I could go back to that notebook and it was like a beacon of light. And so the last time he came, I went to him and said, I want to tell you what I am, uh, what I am getting from these times I have spent with you. And he said, okay. And I said, there's two parts to the sentence. The first is in the seeing is the movement. And he said, yes. And what he's basically saying is that we feel so strongly that all of this darkness that we've taken on, we have to fix, change, rearrange, it's bad and wrong, and it's an endless game of struggle. It's when you can bring your attention fully to what you are experiencing right now that literally that's where alchemy happens. Literally the power of your own attention to be fully with whatever is there, it opens it up and it passes through. But as I said earlier, he didn't teach it with uh, the heart. And the heart, as far as I'm concerned, is our main brain. And the heart is where all lasting healing happened, happens. And when I started hanging out with Stephen when I was 39, that was when I began to be able to truly have space around all of this darkness that I took on, that I almost died of. That's interesting what you just said about the heart. I was reading something the other day. Mm, looks like I don't have it on my computer handy, but uh, it was this, this whole kind of intelligent discussion about the chakras and and uh, the, the kind of the main point of it was that the heart chakra is really the master chakra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, can't do justice to it off the cuff, but um, that's basically, oh, basically what you're saying here. That's it. And, and let me tell a quick story. Mm -hmm. You know, 
that I was interviewed for a book called M Braining, Multiple Braining, a number of years ago. And they took 600 of the leading edge research papers on the fact that we have three brains. Of course, we have many other brains, mm -hmm. sometimes we call them chakras or whatever. But there's three core centers of intelligence, the head, the heart, and the abdominal brain. Right. And the abdominal brain is the only place in the body that has the same kind of cells as are up in our brain. Hmm. And this is that knowing, that gut knowing, that the, the abdominal brain is connected to the wisdom at the heart of life. Yeah. The heart brain is the main brain. And at the HeartMath Institute, they did these amazing studies. And one was that they hooked people up to uh, body sensors, heart sensors, and brain sensors in front of a computer. And the computer randomly chose either horrific, neutral, or beautiful pictures. And for every single person, the heart always responded first. Hmm. But for many of them, the heart responded six to eight seconds before the computer even oh, yeah. chose the picture. Mm -hmm. Why? Because this brain is a tool for maneuvering through reality, but it is not connected. This is connected to everything. Mm. And this is our home. And this is what we long for so deeply is to come home to the wisdom of our heart. Nice. Very well put. You're eloquent. I'll say that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, Adya Shanti, spiritual teacher. Oh, yes. Yeah. He always talks about, you know, head awakening, heart awakening, gut awakening. That They're actually yeah. distinct de degrees of awakening Different. that people yes. undergo. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Interesting. <laughs> you know, one thing that's kicking around in my mind as as you've been speaking is uh the issue of capacity and or or ability to do what you're saying and I'll, I'll elaborate just a little bit like um 20 minutes ago when we were talking about experiencing a lot of pain and being able to, to kind of be open in the midst of that pain uh i was thinking of i think it was saint Teresa of Lisieux who who died of um, tuberculosis of the bone which is supposed to be oh. excruciatingly painful but she, yeah. you know, she didn't even let on. The people, the, the nuns in the monastery didn't even realize she was going through it. And she was doing her tasks and all. And finally, they noticed her limping. And, uh, you know, uh, but she had this sort of radiant, beatific, spiritual, um, you know, vibe about her. Um, so there's, there's an example of someone with immense capacity, oceanic openness, right. you know, who could, who could yep. sort of dissolve or sustain that degree of pain within that oceanic openness. Now, most of us don't have that capacity, and some people, it's not, it's not even a drop, barely. The, right. the, the awareness most is people. so constricted, you know, yeah. so, so tight. Yeah. And so when you ask them to do these things, it's like they don't necessarily have the capacity to do them to right. the extent that others are going to. So I think an, a key question is how to... Um, how to become more oceanic you know how to like right. you know it's a simple analogy and then i'll flip it back to you if, if you take a glass of water and throw a bunch of mud in it doesn't dissolve very well it's only a glass but if you could throw the same amount of mud in a right. swimming pool or in an ocean yeah. you know boom yeah. it's, it's gone so how do you become more oceanic or yeah which is awakening right you know and i think that that uh it's good to go back to the child you know if the child thought it had to figure out how to walk mm -hmm. You know, uh, and then it had this adult brain that every time it fell down, it said, oh, my God, you know, look, at I'm not doing this good enough or right enough. But what the child does is it stands up and then it falls down and then it stands up and then it falls down and stands up and takes a couple of steps and falls down. And so awakening is a little bit like that. We need to understand, you know, I do this finger thing oftentimes. I say, OK, take your finger and follow it with every all your whole body. That's the 65,000 thoughts a day. Awareness, who we really are, is attached to the stories in our head. But if you begin to choose a focus and pull yourself out of the stories, then every time you do, you uh, actually strengthen the muscle of your attention. And so you know, here you are and you're wandering, you're wandering, wandering, and then all of a sudden you come back to the breath or you come back to the sounds. 
And Stephen said once, if you sit for an hour and bring your attention back to your focus one time in that hour, it is time well spent. People need to hear that because they sit down and they want to, you know, meditate and their mind wanders the whole time. And they do it for three days and think, phooey, I can't do this. But if they really understand that one moment, I call it drops of water in the bucket. And, you know, after, you know, a year, the bucket is hardly even, you know, water is hardly even covering the bottom of the bucket. But those moments count. And then one day, without even noticing it, the bucket overflows hmm. with water. So what I did in What's in the Way is the way that at the end of each chapter is a called the remembering section. And it's a 10-week process. You can read the book and not do the process. But we start very small. We start with five minutes a day. And people are opened up to this in the way that this isn't about trying to get anything to happen. This isn't about trying to stay on the breath or that's not a good meditation. You know, there's no such thing as a good or bad meditation. You know, it's, and, and I say, if five minutes is too much, you start with two minutes because that consistency, which strengthens the muscle of your attention so that you can come to the place where that woman is so spacious that excruciating pain can move through her and it's like a handful of mud in the ocean. How do you get there? By strengthening the muscle of your attention. And so in a way we could say, it's a really good thing that you wander off in meditation <laughs> because every time you do, then you will come back. Yeah. Maybe that means maybe that's what Christ meant when he said, even if you have faith as much as a grain of a mustard, yes. a mustard seed, you know, it's like even if, if, even if you don't have very much to start with, it'll grow, you know, right. um, if you persist and, and do something. Yeah. 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 And, and it, it, that's why we need to gather together, because we need to hear there really is truly another way to live. You know, I give a metaphor sometimes of this most gorgeous house with, you know, soaring windows and wonderful gardens. And we live in a windowless basement bedroom <laughs> with a big screen TV. Mm. And we watch our thoughts all day long. We think we are our thoughts. Well, then life brings a sledgehammer. It brings something you can't control. That's a very great gift, like, you know, losing a mate or or uh, financial distress or uh, uh, difficult uh, health diagnoses or something like that. And so life is, is um, uh, taking a sledgehammer to the outer walls of the windowless bedroom. And we get our spackle and we just spackle it up as fast as we can. But then one day, the sledgehammer creates an opening and you look through the opening and you begin to see there's a whole nother world happening here other than this very uh, separate, controlling, conditioned mind. And in that time, Rick, you know, a team of wild horses are not going to be able to keep you away from giving yourself the gift of presence mm. throughout the day. This whole issue of control is interesting. We might be worth coming back to a little bit. I, want, I once heard humility defined as the quality of not insisting that things happen any particular way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah. it seems like there's this sort of individual in the driver's seat that's actually controlling things. But as you've said, um, and as many have said, um, it, that's kind of not the reality of the situation. Not at all. And yet we do have that perception. You know, people say, well, hey, I can either raise my arm or not raise my arm. I have a choice. You know, I, I seem to have free will. And um, so maybe it comes back again to finding the balance point between mm -hmm. exercising what appears to be your, your volition. Yeah, appears and your, to be. Yeah, your, your volition. Yeah. And you exercise it to whatever extent you, you, you can based upon what you, you know, how you perceive it. And, uh, and then what is that? there's this funny uh, Geico commercial these days where, you know, you know they say, uh, 
did you know that, that 15 minutes can save you 15% or more on car insurance? And then, and then the other guy says, duh. So did you know that getting, playing cards with Kenny Rogers gets old really fast? And then you see Kenny Rogers sitting there playing cards with these guys, and he said, you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. And he keeps saying that over and over and over again. <laughs> so it's like uh, there's this balance point, <laughs> is the point I'm getting to, between actually applying some sort of individual will yes. or volition yes, yes. and yeah. and then you know just uh, surrendering to to the co to the larger yes. cosmic intelligence very much so and and in the at the end of the book uh, michael beckwith yeah. he has these four uh, uh stages of consciousness uh and uh i added two in the middle but uh, we well, we probably don't have time to go into those so oh, i'm just going to give him give his four mm -hmm. And it's so very interesting to, to see this in relationship to what we've been uh, talking about. So for most people, they believe life is happening to them. Yeah. And, in, and, and they've got to fight with it. It's very much the victim mode. And uh, there's no judgment. I mean, sometimes I go into that state for a short period of time, but the contraction always wakes me up. And so that's where most people live. Then... Uh, what has been happening for the last hundred years, and especially when the secret came out in the last, you know, ten years or so, now life happens by me. Mm -hmm. You know, the, I like what Stephen says. This is a half truth swallowed whole, <laughs> and now you can create your reality. And uh, and it, it's a very important phase because it gives you a sense of uh, a power when you've been living in a power of helplessness in the phase of life is happening to me. And so it's a really aphrodisiac, but if you live it very long, you'll see two things. Number one, it causes you to be afraid of your thoughts. And number two, it causes you to feel ashamed because of course everybody else can create their reality, but they, but I can't. Carolyn Mace uh, in the nineties was in Seattle. I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't go see her, but a friend of mine did. And, and she was shifting from this, you create your reality to uh, show up for reality. And she asked 600 people, who's been able to create their reality that they want? Not one person opened, lifted their hand. So then you begin to move into life is happening through me. Mm -hmm. And then eventually as me, and I think most people really won't know that and, you know, until they leave their bodies. But that it is a... I think it's more of a, uh, just like the sun, you know, the light comes gradually, you know, in the morning. You know, it is this gradual, you know, here's the dirty word to the ego, surrender. You know, I like the word openness. There is, you know, yes, when you're in the, in the to me, my God, you know, I got free will and I'm in charge and the, by me, yes. But then you begin to see that that never brings you the real deep healing you long for and you begin to relax and you begin to see be life and you become less and less interested in free will and more and more interested in grounding right here and father thomas keating has a quote i have on my bathroom that i absolutely love and i won't be able to you know say all of it but he said the chief act of will is not effort it's consent. Mm. And as you move up the interior ladder of freedom, you become less and less interested in trying to control it and more and more interested in trying to stay open to it. He used different words than that, but that, that, you know, that's the gist of the quote. So yeah, it's a slow, gradual, you know, that you see that life lifts your hand. <laughs> Thought may think it lifts your hand, but where does thought come from? You know, life lifts your hand and then you become the dance. Hmm. And that's what we long for. Well, that was very beautiful. I loved all that. Um, the, the whole thing about we each create our own reality. Obviously, if we took that to its logical conclusion, the world would be complete chaos because we'd all be creating different realities. You know, it'd be like... Uh, oh, that's a good one. Yeah, I mean, how would we agree on whether the, whether there's a stoplight or whether it's red or green? I, you know, I'm seeing a turtle. You you've seen a stoplight? That's <laughs> um, so so. Obviously, there's a larger reality that's that's um, independent of 
what we yes. individually create. And the whole thing about the secret, I think, was brilliant too, because I mean that that whole thing, I didn't like it very much but uh, the whole emphasis seemed to be oh look at this beautiful diamond necklace in the window and look at this beautiful exactly. sports car and i can have these things well who's to say you should have those things yeah. you know i mean is that really in the larger interest of of the evolution of of you know consciousness for both your own and on the planet um so it's i'm just reiterating what you said because you said it very beautifully but um, you know, what it really comes down to ultimately is how can I be of service and, and you know, mm -hmm. how can I be an instrument of the divine, uh, yeah. you know, a sense organ of the infinite, uh, and how can I right. fulfill its prerogatives rather yes. than some much more narrower ones that yeah. I think are good but may not be. Yeah, beautiful. You know, it, we've all been brainwashed into if we just get the diamond necklace or the Maserati or whatever, then we'll be happy. And for a moment, you may be happy, but then, you know, somebody bangs their door into the you know side of your Maserati or somebody steals the necklace or something like that. That what we long for is the joy that comes from the ability to be with what is and the such important point that you made that the ego is all about getting who we are is all about giving in the extent of allowing life to dance us and to me there's no greater joy you know, yeah. no greater joy hmm. it's uh let's let's just for kicks let's take a couple of concrete examples that that people run into in everyday life um, so let's say, for instance, um, I don't know, your your boyfriend breaks up with you or something, and, mm -hmm. and you're you're really heartbroken, and uh, you know you f you feel like this is a, a terrible thing that has happened. So how would you kind of like speak to such a person in terms of how this traumatic event could actually be in their best interest in the bigger right. bigger picture? Right. It it when I was writing, what's in the way? Uh, this came all in one fell swoop. Life is set up to bring up what has been bound up so we can open up to be freed up so you can show up for life. <laughs> well, you might right. as well say that again. It wouldn't be, or, or you could even say it again and then elaborate on each little piece of it if you wanted life to. Life is set up. Mm -hmm. Life is an intelligent process. Life is for life. And to me, it brought forth human beings. I mean, you know, why is a human being even here? My goodness, you know, bees are more important to the function of it, you know, uh, than it looks like with human beings. But, you know, when I get very quiet, it, it really uh, seems to me that life has brought itself together into this frontal lobe so it can celebrate itself, mm -hmm. so it can be here, so it can write poetry so it can look at others through the eyes of the heart mm -hmm. and when you begin to understand that we all have to take on what we're not then there comes a time in your life hopefully younger and younger people will get this that you begin to realize that you put on a fractured pair of glasses when you were young and you're looking at life through this fractured pair of glasses you're actually experiencing them so if you're experiencing life through the fractured pair of glasses. So if you had a alcoholic and abusive father, you may marry somebody that doesn't even look remotely like it, but eventually ends up being really very cruel. So we live these uh, spells. And I love the word spells because it's something that's laid over the top of you. It's not true and it can be lifted. So we just absorbed the spells that our parents absorbed. And life wants us to digest this, to see it and to see through it so we can come back to life. So life is set up to bring up what has been bound up. So I want to tell a story. And uh, uh, you know, uh, this is by uh, somebody that I have a few people that I work with that give me permission to share their stories. And this happened a long time ago. So, uh, uh, well, four years ago. And so it's a young couple, had a young child, uh, and were uh, in a city visiting. And uh, so uh, they split up one night because the wife had some place to go and the husband had some place to go. And they were going to meet at this place where they were going to stay the night. 
and they were going to meet at the baby's uh, uh, bedtime, like eight o'clock. And so as the wife was leaving the place that she was and called the husband to let him know that she was uh, coming, her SIM card broke. SIM and card? What's a SIM card? In the phone. Oh, okay. So her cell phone didn't work. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's no pay phones around anymore. So she gets to the house where the husband's supposed to be, and it's locked. And nobody's there. And she has a crying baby. And finally, after 45 minutes, she thinks, well, maybe I can find a window that is unlocked. And she finds a door and she goes in and she puts the baby to bed. You know, it's about 830 now. OK, and then he doesn't show up until 1145. Mm -hmm. When he walks into the bedroom, she is all nails and teeth and spitting fire and so on and so forth. And he is all defending. This is what we do in relationship. We attack and we defend and we try to justify. And they came to me because uh, they were ready to get divorced because she just did not understand how he could possibly do something like that because he said he was going to be back at 830 and he had his reasons and or eight o'clock and he had his reasons and and all of that. So they came to talk with me and uh, and I said, well, tell me about what your experience was. And I asked the woman first. And she as she started sharing it, she started crying and she said, I felt so alone. I felt so abandonment. Abandoned, which is one of the core spells that we all experience. And then, and she got hurt. She got really hurt. And you could see that nobody had listened to that. The husband hadn't listened to it because he was trying to defend his actions. And, and she, he was trying to defend against her attack. So then I turned to the husband and he started defending and then I said, but what, what are you really feeling right now? And it went into this agony of I'm bad and I'm wrong and I did it bad and wrong. Both of them in that situation was, were finally able to hear the other person. And it cleared out this contraction that had come between them. How we learn how to do that, because the, the woman said, but you know, when he does something that, you know, like that, I, I just, I can't stop myself. I just erupt, you know. And I said, of course you do. But you can learn after the fact to begin to be curious about what did this situation bring up inside of me? And I call it in the book, the U-turn, you know, where you actually, you know, stop talking about whatever brought this up inside of you and you begin to take responsibility for what you're experiencing, which don't hear the word responsibility from the egos. I got to take responsibility. It's the ability to respond. And as we learn how to do that, we begin to understand life is set up to bring up what has been bound up so it can open up. For the first time, this couple really understood that one of the core heartaches that she has experienced her whole life is the experience of being abandoned. And we freed it up in that moment. So they, and they looked at one another at the end of this conversation. There was just such love in their eyes. And once you begin to see the magic of this U-turn, of turning towards, of really being curious about when you are contracted, I call it becoming a tightness detective, then you begin to understand that the challenges of your life are not there because, as we said earlier, you did something wrong or they did something wrong or my parents did something wrong or God fell asleep on the job or whatever, <laughs> or I'm being punished. They are actually there to bring up inside of you what has been bound up. So you, with consciousness, which is the ability to be curious and spacious, and that's why we do the 10-week the process in the book. You can learn how to be curious and spacious. So in the future, when this deep abandonment comes, you know, when the husband promises that he'll repair the roof or something like that, and he doesn't, he doesn't, 
and they get into a horrible argument, the chances are far greater that after the fact, one or the other of them is going to start to get curious now. And then they come in and they say, wow, never guess what was brought up inside of me. This is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm doing with it. So that is really the journey of digesting unconsciousness with consciousness. And you learn it by doing it inside of you. Hmm. Interesting. There's a kind of an interesting context for everything we're talking about right now, which is that there are some spiritual teachers, some of whom I've interviewed, um, who really emphasize on the absolute view. And they, they emphasize that there really ultimately is no person, no individual. And, right. And that all this kind of stuff that you and I are talking about uh, is sort of like dressing up a dream character, you know, right. and fussing over a dream character. Whereas, whereas what you really should be doing is just waking up from the dream and not worrying about the dream character. Yeah. And I, uh, I just came across a quote from Adyashanti in which he said, it can be very difficult for any spiritual teacher to get through to students who are fixating on the absolute view as an, yes. uncon as an unconscious way of avoiding their humanness. Exactly. Yeah, to get them to stop holding yeah. on to their absolute view. This is one of the dangers of awakening, the tendency to grasp at a yes. lopsided view. We grasp at the absolute view of awakening right. and we deny anything else. It, actually, yeah. it is actually the ego that fixa fixates on the absolute view yeah. in this way, using it as an excuse for dismissing unenlightened behavior, thought patterns, and divided emotional states. As okay. soon as we have grasped onto any one view of things, we have gone blind to everything else. Exactly. And we've gone blind to what life is in this moment. Life is an intelligent process but to see how strong that urge to deny is, just think, for the past couple of thousand years, I would say 95% of the gurus or meditation teachers were all about going to enlightenment. And I mean, this is how I woke up in, in the early 60s, you know, my God, we were gonna kill thought. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I used to feel such a failure at it. I, do, I would be in a meditation retreat and I'd open my eyes and I knew everybody else was in nirvana. <laughs> I was there with, you know, struggling with the cesspool, so right. to speak. But then I began to realize what a gift I was given because I couldn't do the spiritual bypass. Right. <laughs> Life said, show up for what I am offering you. And you begin to trust it, Rick. You even the deepest and darkest and most uncomfortable places, you know that that's where the doorway is. Yeah. And I suspect that all those people whom you thought were in Nirvana probably weren't anyway. But, no. <laughs> but if they were, it would be interesting to know where they are today. Be exactly. Because at some point they would have had to work mm -hmm. through this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, and you can have many wonderful spiritual experiences without really awakening. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole interesting point, too. Um, I don't know. We won't, probably won't go into that right now, but um, well, maybe we should talk for a couple more hours. Right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> We'd have to take a bathroom break, and I know you have to go in about ten minutes. But um, right. Um, in and, and incidentally, uh, next week I'm going to be talking to a fellow named Craig Holiday, who's written a book called Fully Human, Fully Divine, which kind of touches on this same theme. So right. it'll, it'll be a nice one-two punch in terms of uh, right. you know the compatibility, and in fact the the necessary symbiosis between humanity right. and divinity, how, how the two are mutually enriching and complementary, not, yes. not exclusive in any way. The yin and yang symbol. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right there, right mm -hmm. there. And we just, we think the yin and yang symbol is light is on one side of a line and dark is on the other side of the line. And it's not, they are nestled together and mm -hmm. in the light is a point of dark and in the dark is a point of light. I, I think that to me, that is the richest symbol I've ever come across. Yeah, it's cool in life. <laughs> <laughs> so in our remaining time, um, what haven't we covered that you'd like to cover? What are some highlights of your book? What are some highlights of your other books? What are some activities that you do that you'd like people to be aware of? You know, what would you like to leave people with? Well, it, one of my favorite chapters in the book is chapter 11. Mm -hmm. And it's called the Bankruptcy, song. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. No, this is different. Okay. It's called The Song of the Heart. Ah. And it's the shortest chapter in the book. 
And I think the best way to get to the essence of that is just imagine you're sitting on the moon. I have a couple of lazy boy recliners up on the moon. I love to hang out on the moon on the because mm -hmm. it gives me a broader perspective. Mm -hmm. And you look across at this blue, green, white jewel of our planet. And you are just stunned with the creativity of it. Mm. And if you doubt that, look over at Mars. You know, beautiful in its own right, but basically red and rock. And look at the moon and it's, you know, brown and dust, you know. But here, jaguars, aardvarks, you know, orchids draping off of trees, uh, uh, baby porpoises, you know, little sea anemones icebergs. I mean, it's endless. Brian Swim, uh, the mathematician that I, I spent a lot of time with, said that life was able to slip between that crack right between the opposites. Hmm. And it celebrates itself in all of this beauty. And we're asleep. So if you're on the planet, uh, on the moon, and you look back and you'll see that there's these two-legged creatures all over the planet. And they all have clouds around their head. And because they have clouds around their head, that cloud bank is made out of fear and it's glued together with judgment. And it causes so much heartache, not only for the person that is lost in the cloud bank of struggle, but also how they act in the world. They can't see the sacredness of life. And to me, one of the greatest gifts we can be given by life is the process of awakening. But also one of the greatest gifts we can give life is the process of awakening. Because you enter the dance differently. You live from the aware heart. You see the sacredness of everything. And in my world, there's a lot of cloud banks that are being cleared. You know, and they come and they go but more and more they're being cleared. And again, just like we talked about, you know, the drops of water in the bucket, you know, uh, a person here, a person there, you know, it's the hundred monkey principle. It doesn't take everybody to wake up. We are in an evolutionary shift and, um, and everybody that is listening to this is a part of that awakening. If you really want to make a difference, with inside of yourself, in your family, with your neighbors, with your community, with the world, heal the war inside of you. And so I feel a very deep passion about that. And that's why I also uh, do retreats. I, lead, I invite people to lift themselves up out of their everyday world and come to really beautiful places. I'll be in Costa Rica in February, and I'll be in Hawaii the next February, 2016. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you come into a very uh, connected, heartfelt, quiet flow of life that is that there's beauty everywhere, it becomes so much easier to do what I call look to unhook. Look, be curious about what the storyteller is doing. Be curious, relate to it rather than from it so that you can become a part of the healing of our planet. And if running away doesn't work for you or running towards, I would say that's running towards, I do phone groups, I do mm. phone counseling, you know, yeah. all of that. So. It's beautiful. I'm glad you brought in that theme. I'm trying to set up an interview with Bandana Shiva, you know, the Indian environmentalist. And uh, be, I feel it would be relevant to this show because, as I was saying in the early part of the interview, I feel like there's a direct connection, and an important connection between yeah. the awakening spirituality in the world and the environmental and other problems that beset Very us and that are critical. And uh, somebody was telling me the other night that if you took all the water in all the world's oceans and formed it into a ball, it would just be a ball sitting on, yeah. the, on the, pretty much would sit on France and cover up that much of, of the world. But otherwise, yeah. the world would be without water. So that we don't have like an infinite ocean in which to dump everything. And, if you, and similarly, I mean, the air is just really this very thin, diaphanous layer. Oh. If, if you went straight up, 
the same distance as it might take you to go to the corner store, you'd be dead, you know, just a few miles. Yeah. And, so this, and yet we've, we dump tons and tons and tons and tons of carbon dioxide yeah. and all kinds of other crap into it all the time. So it would seem to me that um, I, I think that spiritual awakening is going to sensitize people to exactly yeah to the sort of the exactly. preciousness, like you were saying with the sacredness with lawn chair yes. on the moon. Yeah, the, the sacredness, the preciousness, and yeah. and that will really sort of enable us to bring about the kinds of changes that will be needed to absolutely you know, circumvent the kind of a destruction that yeah. we're headed toward. And without judgment, you know, we have we took on this world of unconsciousness that seems to be a part of the dance. And now more and more of us are digesting it. What we've done environmentally before oftentimes is we go against something. Yeah, yeah. Now we're learning how to go for something and not judge all of the, you know, so-called unskillful actions. The unskillful actions are a part of life and they've brought us here to this moment. All my unskillful actions brought me to a place that I was so lost Life said, now get curious. So it's a much different way to enter this healing that is happening on our planet. And it happens one person at a time. Mm -hmm. And if people are really interested, they can also email me and I will be glad to send them the forward and the introduction. Neil Donna Walsh wrote the forward, beautiful forward to the book and the introduction to the book so they can get a sense of what it's about if uh, they want to know. And again, that's awakening at mariomalley.com. Awaken. Awaken at mariomalley.com. At mariomalley .com. Mariomalley .com. Great. All right. All right, well, I know you have to go, so let me make some wrap-up points, and then we'll, we'll conclude. Um, I've been speaking with Mary O'Malley, and uh, she'll have her own page on batgap.com where I'll be linking to her website and her books and have a bio of her and all that. Uh, so you can check her out and bounce from there to her website and explore all kinds of things that are there. Um, this interview is part of an ongoing series. Uh, there are over 260 of them now. And so at batgap.com, you will see menus where you can find all the interviews categorized in various ways, alphabetical, topically, and, and so on. Check that out. Um, you can subscribe to an audio podcast so that you can listen to this as you commute or something. And you'll see a link for that. There's a donate button, which I appreciate people clicking and rely on people clicking in order to be able to do this. Um, as much as I do it. <laughs> uh, there's a place to be to sign up to be notified each time a new interview is posted, which means you'll get an email about once a week. And um, a few other things. Poke around the menus, you'll see it all. So that's at batgap.com. So thanks a lot for listening or watching. Uh, we'll see you next week with Craig Holiday, and thank, thank you again, Mary. It's been really a pleasure to talk to you. Such a joy, Rick. Such yeah. a joy. All right, have a good day, and maybe we'll meet in person one of these days. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye.